Thursday night edition of the Crash the Pond podcast. This is a very special show. This is actually probably the first show that we've recorded where I've been a little nervous before recording. So hopefully, you know, hopefully nothing goes wrong here. Hopefully I don't say anything inflammatory. We'll see. But we are joined by Julie Stewart Binks, who hosts Drinks with Binks on Fubo Sports Network. New episodes air Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Fubo Sports Network is available at a, as a free channel on LG channels powered by Zumo, Pluto TV, Samsung TV Plus, the Roku channel, and Zumo, as well as in Fubo TV's Fubo Standard Base subscription package. You can check them out at FuboSportsNetwork.com. So, Julie, welcome to the show. This this is going to be a treat for us, but thank you so much for, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm also nervous, too. So we're in the same <laughs> boat about <sighs> this interview right now. I'm sure you are. It's been a while are. since I've chatted ducks, so I, I'm also very excited to join you guys. Oh, yeah. We're, we're really going to grill you on some of their, their <laughs> C-level prospects. You know, how do you think Roman Derny is progressing in the ECHL? I know, just kidding about that. But to... <laughs> I, would, I would improvise that if you'd ask perfect, that, by the perfect. way. Perfect. You probably That's could. That's where my improv background would come in. You know, you can you can answer kind of any question about any player very vaguely, as I'm sure many coaches probably do sometimes, oh, yeah. or obviously players too, because we know interviews I mean, are all the same most some, of the time. Some might say that's how I've done half of this podcast overall in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Just know, answer, it, answer the last thing that someone said, right? Like, yeah, don't, like someone asks you a really long question and then just respond to the last thing they said. So. Yeah. I feel like I should be taking notes right now, but uh, you know, you're you're the one answering questions here. So they're just little hacks. Well, I mean, if it's an ECHL prospect, you can probably just say, "Yeah, I think he probably won't make it," and you'd you'd probably be right. Um, and then I'd have to though wonder, like, what's going? I don't even know if the ECHL is playing right now, right? Oh, like, oh, they, they are. They, they are. are. They're, okay. They're yeah. The well, there belt. we go. Then <laughs> you bet they are. <laughs> there's so probably neat. there's probably fans in the stands too. I would imagine. Oh. You know? Oh yes, you're right. <laughs> packed, packed barn for some of those games. Yep, yep. Full bore. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's dive into our, our pressing questions here. That that we I'm actually fascinated to hear some of your answers. So let's just jump right in. For most Ducks fans, including ourselves, Jake and I, we were first introduced to your work when you were reporter for Fox Sports Prime Ticket, obviously covering the Ducks. But since then, I mean, you've gone on to cover a wide spectrum of sports. You know how. Was that challenging for you at all? I mean, it, it doesn't sound like it would have been, but how has it been? How does that, how have you made it seem so seamless, you know, since that time? Well, it's funny because actually, like before the Ducks job, I did a lot of different sports. I mean, mostly hockey was always sort of my main thing. Grew up in Canada, worked in the prairies of Canada, covered a lot of junior hockey out there. And then when I moved to the States, I was sort of told like, don't like that hockey thing you like anymore because that's not the big sport here. <laughs> like quite literally, I believe that's like a quote verbatim from wow. a, a former a boss I had. So I was like, okay, I'll learn this college basketball thing. And like, you know, we, in Canada, you follow March Madness, but like you don't follow, you don't even follow like the, the tournaments, the conference tournaments leading up to it or anything like that. And so I, I you know, branched out FS1, did a lot of stuff. And then, I remember I actually did some stuff with the Kings before I did the Ducks because Patrick O'Neill was doing some college football stuff. And they're like, hey, do you want to fill in? I was like, yes, I love hockey. Like, give me all the hockey. And then they were like, you're too into it. Like, don't <laughs> don't like that thing as much. It's it, you know, it's on a regional level, like focus more on the national stuff we have. I'm like, no, but I love this hockey thing. So then I kind of fell into the Ducks job really randomly. Um, it's an it's an odd story because um, Allie Lozoff, who is the sideline reporter now for the Ducks, that was her job. Like she was supposed to have the job. I think this is maybe fairly well known. I'm not sure around the hockey world it is, but then, um, she had some family issues that she had to deal with in Canada and she couldn't come down for the job. So Fox was like, Hey, can we borrow you for like three games? And I was like, yes, oh my gosh, I'm so excited, yada, yada, yada. I, I did three games, and they're like, okay, our sideline reporter can't come yet, so can you do this month? I was like, yes, of course, I'd love to. <laughs> and then, I mean, it was sort of also at, at the jurisdiction of, like, my bosses at FS1, and I also did MLS and stuff like that. So I just, I ended up, because because um, Allie had to deal with some personal stuff, doing the whole season. 
And then I ended up staying for like three seasons, I think pretty much. Um, and it was amazing. Like it was, I would have to say it was the most enjoyable job I've ever had in, I've had like a hundred jobs, as you mentioned since then even, but in my entire life. And so to answer your original question, like going from there, um, I've always been able, I've always been able to handle a lot. No, I've just kind of been, maybe it's like growing up as sort of that one man band, jack of all trades of like, oh, you need someone to cover a curling bond spiel in somewhere in Southern Saskatchewan. Like, of course we have to go there. We have this or we have this. And you just sort of like adapt what kind of skills you have to then I really wanted to do more with personality. I wanted to host I wasn't about to go, you know, stab Kent French in the back and try to get that hosting <laughs> gig because Frenchie's like salt of the earth, best guy in the world. So I'm like, all right, I got to get on to like a new challenge and do like a little bit more. I just wanted that myself. And so since then, I've done like uh, many different things and I do miss the game. I mean, we've all missed the game this year and we miss it still because no one can really fully be at it. But I think like doing a lot of these other different things, it, it just it people always think you have to do one thing or you are supposed to do just that one thing. But you can do whatever you want. Like you're yeah. not just a side, you're not a sideline reporter. You can be this. You don't have to be just a host. You can do whatever you want. So I was kind of trying to defy those odds of like whatever box people put me in so that I could just have more fun doing this kind of stuff. So it's been a it's been a journey. Yeah. And kind of I think that's a great transition to the next kind of question that we had for you was that kind of you've done a really good job ever since that and kind of after you've left Fox Sports doing more of that host or doing the more kind of your own type of thing your own hosting everything along those lines and one of the things that you did was going into stand-up comedy for a while or doing some of that how has that kind of helped you with your uh with your sports media career because that's one thing that I'm curious about because I love stand-up comedy find it very entertaining I don't know how much I would want to go up and do it necessarily. So uh, uh, really, really highly uh, uh, in awe of you being able to do that just because I think it's a really interesting transition to make and one that I think probably helped you out a bunch also. Yes. Well, uh, I appreciate that. The understanding that it is, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Of course, Mm -hmm. it's like the most uh, painfully anxiety crippling (laughs) thing to do ever. But the payoff is incredible. The high you get, like when strangers laugh at a joke that you've written and performed is like no other. But there's definitely more anxiety than there are payoffs. (laughs) (laughs) And, And I just found I started doing improv because I wanted to get better at listening and responding. And because I was hosting a radio show at the time. And I also just was like, this is just another tool in my arsenal. You know, there's a lot of people in my improv classes that wanted to be actors. I was like, I don't want to be an actor, mm-hmm. although I would love to be an actor if I was actually any good at it, but I'm not. And I'm old for acting world, whatever. Maybe not. I don't know. Whoever's watching this. <laughs> uh, so you can do whatever you want. doesn't matter. But back to my main point is that it was it just helped me think on my feet more and also just get more confidence in front of like, whoever. And so doing that, it was so fun. And it, you know, you had to kind of, at one point I'll keep, it's kind of hard to explain, but you had to tell monologues to then draw Mm -hmm. premises from, and people were like, you do, you, you have such great stories. Like you have all these random stories and things that have happened to you. You should do stand up." And then I was on, I was doing like Instagram stories and I realized I was kind of with my Instagram stories doing like bits and I would craft them in the way that had, you know, the setup and then the punchline that would take people the other direction or whatever. So many people are like, you got to do stand up. And so at the time I was able to, I had the time to mm-hmm. just enrolled in a class at Caroline's. I'm like, <laughs> when I enrolled in it, I remember the woman, I was definitely getting cold feet after I had done it, but I saw she worked with people on, on TV and she's like, you know, what's the worst that can happen? And I was like, the worst that can happen is that I have like crippling anxiety and want to murder myself like and and follow through with it. That's the worst that can happen <laughs> from this uh, because it's it is takes a lot of balls to get up there yep. for sure. So did it um, was awful. But then after doing my first like student class, like student show, it was amazing. I was like, OK, I want to do this again. And then, you know, when you find something, you're like, 
I want to keep, I want to get better at this. I want to keep going. And then I got a job where like I had to work at night. I couldn't be like, Hey boss, I got to go to, a, I got a six minute set at the Grizzly pair for $25. Like, no, I have to go do my work so I can pay my rent. So, but I, to really answer your question is like, I look at it as just more tools mm -hmm. in terms of writing, in terms of confidence with, being able to think on your feet. A lot yeah. of stand up though is not, at least for me, where I was, which is very, very like you have to. I'm just doing Judd Apatow's uh, masterclass right now, which I uh -huh. highly recommend doing because it, it just, it, it gives you a lot of confidence in terms of like you are going to suck for a really long time before you're good. And it kind of takes some pressure off of you. No one is good at comedy right away because it's, it's an art, it's a craft, it's a skill, and you get better at it. The more you go through stuff, like the amount of times you'll write, you know, the the um, setup for your joke and then mm -hmm. the punchline, like you'll write like 20 of them before you're like, maybe one of these is OK. Yeah. And so you take pressure off yourself to take a long time to get there. And he had a great line, which was like, it's the only job that you have to that you do and you suck at and you have to suck at it to get good because <laughs> that doesn't happen in any other job. You don't, you don't become a doctor and suck at being a doctor and then become good at being a doctor. Like you have <laughs> to be good from the start. So uh, I just think of it as when you're writing, especially with writing, um, it, it, it gives you almost another dimension of how to look at things differently. And then now in my job, I look at it as like stand-up comedy is a lot of point of view and then relatable idea. So I think the Ducks power play is blank. It's good. It's bad. It's whatever. <laughs> what is that like? What is that like? Right. And you kind yeah. of like start thinking and the further you can get away from what someone might think you're going to say, that's where the funny thing comes from. Cause it's so, Oh wow. That took me completely yeah. for a loop. So it's, it's kind of like, like it's good for your brain in a way. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it challenges you and it challenges the way that you think and trying to deliver things in a way to keep people entertained, which is at the end of the mm -hmm. day, what we're all doing here. <laughs> yes. Well, I have a couple, I mean, I have so many questions from that, so I'll try to keep them concise here. Um, you know, for, for comedy, is it just like, is it just something where you're, you're born with it? Some people are just, they're able to conquer that or to you, is it, is it like something that can actually be like, anyone can learn, anyone can be trained in. And then the follow-up to that is like, what's what's your process, you know, going about this? What, how do you get to that point? You know, what's what's your productivity hack when you're coming up with with new bits or or whatever the case may be? I think that yes, um, I think that there's varying levels with that. Like some people are just funny. Like they just they they've got they maybe when they're kids they were could even just be being around brothers or sisters, mm -hmm. what kind of TV shows you watched, your sense of humor, like these different sort of that nature, those forces in a way. Um, like even my brother and I will laugh at things because we watched too many episodes of The Simpsons when we were kids. So we kind of have this similar humor of like so, sort of like Simpsons type of stuff. But and Family Guy, that sort of like darker, dirtier humor in a way. But anyone can get good at comedy. You know what I mean? It's a skill. So it, it takes time. So it's like, if you don't know, like you, 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 it depends like kind of like what type of comedy you're trying to do. Like, are you trying to write for yourself? Are you trying to write for other people? Are you trying to write a story? And then you figure out, um, you, if it's, you're doing stand up, you got to figure out, as I mentioned, your point of view. And it's like, who am I? Who am I on stage? Like when I walk on stage, who do they see? And you have to recognize, like, when, when I walk on stage, people see someone they don't like because they're like, oh, this girl seems to probably have everything together. People don't want to see someone that's, like, successful or has a job or, <laughs> oh, she kind of talks like she's a broadcaster. I have to address that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I look like a basic bitch. You have to, <laughs> uh, you have to acknowledge that. The, the crowd, like, when you bring yourself down, the crowds, like, can ease up. Right. Because no one wants to like it's not funny to see someone up on stage being like, yes, well, I work at ESPN <laughs> and I'm amazing. Like, that's not funny. Yeah. And it's not dark. So it's just a lot of trial and error. And when I started and I'm I suck still, I haven't been able to do stand up in like two years. I also stopped for a long time because I 
was going strong. And then when you stop, you realize how awesome life is not doing it um, and not <laughs> having to go to these open mics where you want to murder yourself because there's no there's no people there other than other comics. So you're doing the same jokes in front of people. Like I'll be like, hey, guys, I'm working on the Bachelorette play by play joke again tonight <laughs> and trying out different references trying out different numbers people laugh at different numbers like different sounds make people laugh huh. you have to try it out i tried out this bachelorette play-by-play -play joke 20 times and never got it still in the back in the it's like it it has potential but it still needs to be worked out but yeah you can learn it it's definitely um uh, a learned skill and then for me Right now, my show drinks with things like we don't really do comedy on it, but we try to play games with some people. So this is not necessarily anything riveting, but you're trying to take something that might be interesting about someone and take it like anything in life, take it to the next level. Like, OK, what would be funny with this person coming on this week? OK, well, they're into X, Y, Z. Okay, but what would be, that's already been done before, but what if we did, like, try to think, like, write down all the things associated with it, and then write down all the opposite things associated <laughs> with it, right? And so you mm -hmm. can kind of start, you just have to start playing around. Like, it's honestly a lot of trial and error. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, it works. Uh, having watched your show, it, it's entertaining, <laughs> and the, the games are fun. It's, it's, it's we entertaining. We try, you know, yes. some days I'm just like, I just made this game up right before the commercial break and we're going to see if this can happen. I and feel like most of the time it doesn't, but I feel we like try. Those, I feel like those end up being the better ones where it's just kind of shoot from the hip, at least just at least with our stuff. Whenever yeah. it's very much me just throwing stuff at Felix out of the blue. I feel like that ends up being more entertaining, at least for me. That's it your depends view. if your yeah. partner is w w willing to play, right? <laughs> true. Like, true. Yeah. I, I force always a toss sometimes. up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let, let's get into some some ducks topic. That was that was really really. Sorry, yeah, that was uh, no, my, that was like no, that was great. philosophy on comedy of which I'm not good at, nor do I know how to do. And uh, but there you go, everyone. That was super <laughs> enjoyable. I mean, I I love stand up comedy. I love watching different things, hearing people talk about their experience with it, hearing them rewrite jokes to just. Tw uh, tweak it that little bit to make it work it's fascinating it's something that it, it i would like to honestly watch some more and i'll probably watch that judd apatow yeah uh, everyone and then just everyone who's on stage and does these things they have done those jokes like hundreds of times yeah huh. like like you think it might be especially even the ones off the cuff you think they've thought about their tags they've thought about some of the improvisations as well yeah even the words every word is sometimes picked out huh um so bringing this back to the ducks <laughs> let's 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 go with kind of the best starting point with comedy. Kevin Bieksa. He's definitely probably the the player that I would think of the most in the last five, six years that would uh, bring me joy in his antics off the ice. So what would you say is your favorite Kevin Bieksa memory that we may not have seen on camera that you feel like sharing? <laughs> Ooh, great question. Because I feel like a lot of Kevin BX's antics were on camera, but um, I think like I remembered once he started to warm up to me when he found out I was Canadian, and I'll never forget <laughs> that he was like, "Oh, Binksy, you're from Canada." <laughs> like, yeah, like I thought everyone knew that. I thought that was like a very well known. Like I printed <laughs> it on my forehead. He's like, oh, no, I thought you were an American. And I was like, OK, but also the way you said it like that, like, is a, would there be something wrong if I was a U.S. girl? Um, but then he started to then be almost then warm up to me in a way, because he was always he was always, you know, he's a unique personality. Mm -hmm. He is someone in the media that you are like, oh, great, we can get if there's a Ducks lost or down a goal we have to talk to someone we always had it kind of like what was it if the ducks were down by more than two you talk to the other team but if it's <laughs> one or if it's like they just got scored on probably not going to get a player from the team from the ducks because the coach would not like allow them out of the room but if you could <laughs> or left a loss it would be like we're going to get kevin bxa pat maroon back in the day um and maybe like a nate thompson or um uh, like ben lovejoy let's go back oh. even further guys that can just talk about the game yeah when there's a loss and it's like it's just gonna it's, we're all just gonna do our jobs for the day but kevin always like 
Uh, well, there's two times he razzed me on camera, which were funny uh, to uh, people watching and to, <laughs> rattling to me because I never had a player kind of goof around on camera before, okay. especially a hockey player where the answers are so they're just so canned and you know exactly yeah. even if like we would go i would do this like go through and find words and like go through a thesaurus and be like what can i bring into these questions today just to like <laughs> spice them up and make them sound cool now i've learned that's not the case just ask a simple question what happened here blah 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 it's about them it's not about the reporter a lot of reporters don't know that but um, anyway, I digress. Is that he he got me when it was we were in Calgary, I believe. Yes. And in the playoffs. And I was like, thank you so much, Kevin. And as he was leaving, he was like, uh, you're welcome. But I didn't have a choice and just walked off. And then right. it's Legendary. like, yeah, it's like and I'm just like back to you, Kent. But like, like I'm <laughs> I just that's where my improv. I wish I had done improv. And then. But he was so quick with it. He walked off. I'm like, damn it, Julie. That's what he like, does. <laughs> if you were better now, like you could have like riff. Maybe we could add a little riff sort of thing. And then he got me the day after New Year's. New Year's Day. He was like, oh, wow, three questions. That's a lot for you. Because I started on my third question. <laughs> and let's just say I was a little foggy brain the day <laughs> after the New Year's Day. And I just was like totally taken for a loop. I just started laughing. So I was just like, oh, I was I was shocked. Like, <laughs> but anyway, so he told me because I guess I I put it up on Instagram recently and I tagged him and he's like, oh, everyone thought I was I was so mean to you doing those things. I was like, oh no, not at all. Like I I mean mean you weren't mean at all. Those were those were interesting moments and I think they were funny at the time. I wish I had better comebacks. Like that's really it. <laughs> but he was such a nice guy and you knew he was going to be if he had wanted to at the time. I didn't. I didn't know if media would be in his future. It almost like you didn't think about it. Cause you were like, he still, it still felt like he had a lot of time, left. not a lot of time left, but like a significant mm -hmm. amount of time left that it would be insulting to say, Oh, you'd be good at media. Cause then that would insinuate that his career is over or going to be over. And he's just dominated right now. Like watching him on sports net, he is obviously so smart in the game, but he can dish it out too. Obviously we know that, but that he also, um, he he can play right like he can play off of people he clearly has a lot of confidence but he's sort of relatable in that way not the haircut but his personality <laughs> is that's the critique the, the hairdo. it's the last time i was up in canada or i was no i was streaming the, like a uh, hockey night in canada and i was like man the high that's the high is too high for the tight like the the <laughs> you know it was it was it was too much it was almost like completely shaved and then just this like Main. squirrel on top of his head. Too, and I was too, like, okay. too much on top. No. Too much on top. Yes. <sighs> but uh, yeah, no, I think the he would always razz me. It's hard to pick out one. But the biggest one was when he found out I was Canadian, how positively happy he was about all that. that <laughs> so that's sorry, guys. He didn't ask you where in Canada. That was just the fact. I think that you're he, yeah, he must have been like, I was like, yeah, I'm from Toronto. Yes, that was it. I, he did because he's like, oh, Toronto girl, like Leafs fan. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, no, I'm unbiased. I'm a journalist, <laughs> and I was, I was. Whenever oh. the Ducks played the Leafs, <laughs> I always wanted a happy plane ride home. So I basically bet would be hoping that they beat the Leafs because oh, you don't right. want so you, you don't want a sad plane ride. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. that, that was when the Leafs, uh, that was pre Austin Matthews. Right. And so it, it was mm -hmm. a different time back when, uh, yes. the roles were completely reversed. It's still pretty much the same time, but that's just cause there's like a curse on the team. So yeah, fair enough. Even though they're good right now, I but never trust it until the very end. <laughs> Do you like their reverse retros? No, I hate them. Really? Yeah. I can't I stand them. I can't read them. First of all. And yeah. I also just don't, they look like a practice jersey, but they're, I, I, why? I don't want those ones. I want, I want blue like the and gray. white. I don't, I hate the gray. I hate the gray. <laughs> yeah. We, we did a jersey ranking on our bonus show and Jake's metric what, for what, judging metric? a jersey was, was this team a coward or not yeah. by the choices that they made? The reverse, so did, the reverse retro program is supposed to be like all this bright colors going something yeah. different, something out there. So if a team, for instance, the Kings jersey is great. Don't get me wrong. The the purple and oh gold boy. gold is great. But if they wanted to not be cowards, they would have gone with the Burger <laughs> King jersey. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The burger. I I have like one of those from a, a like a tournament I played in that looks like that. It's I mean, that would be great, right? It, you yeah. want to I that's why I liked when the first night I saw the Leafs ones, like the oil they were playing the Oilers and it's mm-hmm. like Oh man, they got like the the orange pants and they got the orange. Uh, it was great. Just great. I love the orange mitt. I think that orange mitts. Yeah, it was like awesome, like so wild. And then it was like Leafs don't look <laughs> retro at all. They just kind of look like, a, yeah, just like a practice jersey. Yeah, so. it, it's kind of kind of cyborg looking. But outside of Bexa, though, I mean, who who's someone else on the team that you know you particularly enjoyed interviewing that maybe might not come to mind right away for, you know, the average fan and who was maybe a little tougher to, to get a reaction out of. Okay. Well, um, of those years. Okay. So I mentioned Pat Maroon. We know, um, big rig is great. And the fact that he had two Stanley cups is quite literally insane, but he was always, you know, he just was very easy to talk with and, it's always nice when they, when the players, you, it's almost like you live in two separate realities and it felt nice when they cared about you. Like when they asked you questions or they were, they took an interest in your life. Like when Kent had a, his daughter, you know, Getzlaff and Perry were all like asking him questions and like, you know, Getzlaff's telling, giving him advice and all this. It was like, it, <laughs> it was very humanizing, right? Like yeah. you don't see these moments with, players and like being with media and kind of like we're all in this thing together and um i would say okay oh francois boschman was also very great friendly good guy um and and with in terms of being like media Mm -hmm. savvy like a lot of them got better as they went along right like maybe ricard raquel wasn't amazing at first Mm -hmm. on camera but soon was then actually saying was able you'd able to be able to get stuff out of him or Jacob Silverberg or some of these guys that maybe like they wouldn't normally be super comfortable answering all these questions in English. And then they, they started to kind of warm up to the idea and have some fun. And uh, Jacob and I had like a, we, it was like social media night back then. It was like Snapchat. I remember at the end of our interview, I was like, can I just like do this? I have to do the Snapchat thing where we were re- 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 our faces. And he was like all for it. And even Paul McLean back then too was, was great. Like there there were some of them that were, they, you knew what you were doing was annoying to them, but they wouldn't show it. Right. Like me standing beside (laughs) just some of these coaches on the bench, like right after the anthem and interviewing them, like right before puck drop had to have been so annoying. Right. And especially uh, before even like coming back from an intermission And they just did it. Like even if they'd be in the middle of explaining what they were going to do on that power play or penalty kill that was about to happen. And you're like, Hey, I'm here to do the interview. And they're like, Oh yeah. Okay. And like would come over to you and you're like, I feel like I'm interfering with like the game right now. (laughs) You do your thing. Um, And then Nate Thompson was great too. As you can kind of like see a lot of these guys, like leadership guys gets off was more difficult to get stuff out of. Huh? He's a true captain and that he talks without saying anything at all. We yeah. know that. That's yeah. the Sidney yeah. Crosby playbook. <laughs> Just being able to answer a question without really telling you a whole lot because they don't want to get in trouble, right? So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I can remember right now, the guys. Yeah. Um, so kind of now going into a bit of the, the broadcast size, what was it like working aside John Allers and Brian Hayward? Uh, Ducks fans kind of have a different – range of opinions of the team broadcasters. Uh, so I wanted to know kind of what your experience was like, any fun stories with them. Um, I can't say any of those stories on this podcast. That Sounds good. How great it was working alongside those two. Uh, first of all, it sounded so ominous when you said like ducks fans have opinions of the broadcasters. like, Oh gosh, I haven't gone on ducks Reddit in a long time. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> neither did I go on it. Thank God when I worked there, but I have gotten it for other things and been like, okay, I guess I should go get reconstructive surgery on my face now. <laughs> I digress. I would say working alongside Hazy and Johnny Allers was amazing. They are like two creepy uncles. I'm joking. They're not creepy. They were so nice. <laughs> they were the best. Like our, our TV crew was, as I mentioned, it was the most fun job I've ever had. It was 
quite, quite literally like the most enjoyable time of my career because we were all just like a team. We were our own team. Like we on the road, we would always go out. We would go for dinners or drinks or 10,000 drinks. And <laughs> we would all razz each other. And we were all just like part of this thing together. And it was like, whether everyone wanted to go out, whether it was just like a couple people, but you know, we'd pick different cities that we knew or someone knew someone that could get us a reservation here. We knew that another team was in town and, oh, we knew their broadcasters. So we went out with them and it was like, you just got to know everyone's mm -hmm. families. I've been over to their houses before. Um, and I haven't had that kind of connection with other jobs I've had. I think definitely ever since then, but I don't think I've ever had the level of, of, caring about people that I did with them and their teammates that that want you to do well because there's in this business there's a lot of people that try to you know hit you on the back of the legs and and take you out and this group was like everyone just wanted to serve up the best pass that they possibly could to make the other person look good mm -hmm. and so if Ducks fans have any criticisms about them that's obviously their own opinion, but as people, salt of the earth, every single one of them and everyone in the truck, that's the TV truck where, mm -hmm. you know, we have so many people working on the broadcast as well. It's not just obviously the people in front of the camera, but everyone back there too. We were all very, very close. That, that sounds like a great time. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and I, I want to follow up on that. So you mentioned kind of traveling, going to all these different places with them, having a great time. When all of this is over, I want to try to go to more uh, more rinks for more away rinks, see Ducks play there, maybe see whoever play wherever. What would you say is a must-go-to destination uh, as a traveling fan to, to just go for a weekend, go see a game, go hang out? I think, honestly, you would probably want to uh, – like a Montreal would be great because you've got the whole city mm -hmm. and you can kind of go up for like a great dinner in old Montreal and have drinks and – and whatever you want to do in your spare time. And then the game, like the Bell Center is in an insane asylum and they play their crazy, the Habs play their crazy goal song in French, whatever it is. And it's like this weird song, but it's like cr the whole place is just like, it's, it's very much alive. Nashville is also a time. We spent way too much time there when the Ducks <laughs> faced them in the playoffs in like, I don't even know what year, 2016, 2015 I saw a blur I don't I just have to look at my camera roll to find out like what happened and what year and what month and we were there for like a week it was so odd because of the amount of time between the games we we're like okay we're in Nashville for a week we're gonna be dead because Frenchie Kent got us one day one of those bice booze bicycles like one of oh bicycle taverns I've, I've, I've seen up, seen them Pardon me? I've seen him uh, on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, we ended like up, um, it just ended up being like me and Frenchie and like a couple other people, but not not the whole TV crew. And we're like, oh gosh, like we have to bike a lot and we have a lot of booze. And some of the players were out that day and they like saw us on it and they're just like, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> they're, they're like, oh my God, like these guys are so lame, <laughs> these broadcasters. So we didn't really like, we never, if we, like when we were in Calgary one time, we went to Cowboys, which is, uh, the new one is a bit different. It's like in a casino. It's sort of like a, it's a legendary bar. We went and it's like, if the other, uh, if, if the players were there before us, whoever's there first, the others have to leave. Like we'll never be at the same bar as the players. Mm -hmm. And, but that night was when they swept the flames in 2017, I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. So, Correct. but we were both there at the same time and we were like, who cares? And that was like kind of a funny. Bieksa was very nice to us then. He was like, he actually, <laughs> he was I in believe, good spirits. it was like the players were over at the bar and we were like, okay, we're going to be at the other side of the bar. And Bieksa was like, let me buy you guys around. Like, you guys are great, whatever. So we're like, oh, that guy's nice. Aww. And yes, you should buy us around because we make like 0.00001% of what you make. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, Vancouver was always a great time too. Um, there's a lot of fun things to do there. Just a beautiful place to go and do like a great weekend away. Um, not so much. I mean, obviously can't do any of this stuff right now, nope. but when the world supposedly opens back up again and Chicago, that's a great, you know, that's classic, 
great. There's so many good cities. You can make a case for like all of them, but maybe Sunrise, but you could stay in Florida, but you could stay in like Fort Lauderdale and have like a nice time on the beach. But um, yeah, like it was great. I, it was it was such a cool experience to get to go yeah. to all these different arenas. And sometimes you're only there for like a hot minute and sometimes you're there for like a hundred days <laughs> and you'd be stuck in like, we're like, why are we in Buffalo for like a oh. hundred days? Because Randy Carlisle does not want us to go to New York City any earlier than we need to, you know? So <laughs> some of those trips were strategic based on the coaching staff. Yeah, speaking of coaching, what was the main difference covering Boudreaux and Carlisle? Uh, everything. Um, <laughs> it, it's like having like a warm, nice grandpa versus like uh, an awful like school teacher that hates you. Basically, um, <laughs> I'll let you decide who is who. Oh. But I uh, know Bruce Boudreaux is uh, like just such an incredible person, and. Um, he cared a lot about us and his his um his niece is Rachel Bonetta from FS1. Oh, I didn't so, know that. So, yeah, like by uh like sort of by marriage in a way like he's not related to mm -hmm. her and so um that was sort of a funny thing like we'd always talk and chat and Bruce was so great and even after he left the Ducks and he was with Minnesota like he invited us all over to his house for dinner. He just wanted to hang out with us. Like, he was so great. And then that was not the same with Randy. So, no uh, dinners. What you, if there were, we definitely were not invited to those. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it, it still is different. Like, you're, you're in a market where it's not Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, Toronto Maple Leafs or like any of these big places. Like, you're, it, you're a smaller market yep. team. It's a bit more family style, family together. Um, from ownership down to every single person that worked at Honda Center. It was like everyone just was very close and it felt mm -hmm. it, it felt nice. There are also times it didn't feel nice because it's close, like a family, right? That's just mm -hmm. how it goes. Yeah. But um, I'd say I'll never forget, though, Game 7 against uh, the Blackhawks oh, that oof. day with Bruce – we knew they were going to lose in the morning. Just felt it. Um, really? Yeah. And you could just tell because uh, Bruce had never won a game seven. Mm -mm. And it was like his whole demeanor was was just kind of shook. And we were like, Oof. OK, like I just remember being like, I have no hope in the world that they win tonight. Like I just because that it just you could just feel it, that whole vibe in the whole place. Um and that was different than Randy, of course. Uh, Randy was, if he felt that kind of way, he definitely showed it in more of an in, in more of an aggressive, angrier way. I'm not saying Randy Carlisle is the devil. I know it sounds like I am, but Randy is who he is. We've seen mm -hmm. it on camera. That's pretty much what you get. And so just two very different people. Yeah. Huh. That is fascinating. Well, okay, let's... Uh... Man, I have so many follow-up questions, but... <laughs> I'm like, here's we... all the secrets of the Ducks, and everyone who isn't the Ducks is like, Julie, shut up. <laughs> right, yeah, we should, we, we should probably... Don't worry, yeah. guys. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's ask you uh, one final question here that I'm sure won't... This isn't controversial at all, but uh, should the Ducks bring back the Mighty Ducks logo and uniforms full-time? Where do you stand on the Ducks, just hmm. their look as a whole? Because this is maybe the most divisive issue among the fan base i don't know what do you think is it okay so the the which the oldest oldest let's see yeah the, like the mighty what, ducks jersey what you think of yeah. when you think mighty ducks yeah that's a great question because i would say yes but i also then think i don't think of the hockey team i think of gordon bombay like i don't i <laughs> huh. i like i have a I have kind of like uh, my mind is is confused, but I think that I love the but it's unique. Right. And like yeah. that's sort of their that's where they came from. And, and so sells. I would say, <laughs> why not? Like it's it's very much recognized around the world. It's super cool. Like it, I love the old school. Like go just you might just go back to that. Fans would like it. Right. Like that sells. Yep. yep. That's yep. that's that's big time. You know, I don't actually have any ducks gear 
at all. Huh. 0.0 Ducks gear. I think I have like a towel I got from a playoff series that just because like, you're an objective journalist. Yeah, can't be, can't be rolling around with. I was you know, like, how? I feel like when I I hosted like four Kings games, I got like some like something from them. I was like, did not any swag guys when I left? Just a hat? Just throw, just throw it know? my way. Just throw it my way. The mighty Ducks yeah, jersey, perhaps. I got I got zero, nothing. No, um, that's okay. Someone else more deserving can have that. But uh, yeah, I okay. I'll I'll go, I'll go with the fans with this one. Let's go. Let's throw it all the way back. What What about you guys? Are you on board or not? Well, I, I'm marking you down as Team uh, Eggplant and Jade, just for the record. Uh, I, so you're you're attached to that now. Okay. I, I I'm not a Ducks fan, so I don't have this huge emotional attachment. But I do think it'd be a lot more enjoyable than what they have now. You pumped his tires hard when uh, you were uh, uh, saying everyone should go to Montreal. He's a Canadians fan. Yeah. So, and oh, well, so, yeah, we, yeah, we us Leafs fans over here be you guys this we yeah. recording this on the we, Wednesday night. We don't so need I'm, to talk about that. that that's... Thursday. I don't even know what day it is, but I'm sure Saturday you're going to. It's a day. It's a day. Whoop. But North I, Division looking real great these days, by the yeah. way, just because they can play games. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Shocker. <laughs> what a Not thought. So surprising. Like, who would have thought that, that the Canadian teams would have fared better Shocker. in this scenario? Shocker. It's going to be very interesting when it comes to the end of the season. And like half of the teams have only played like 25 <laughs> games and we have to figure out what to do. Yeah. Points percentage, baby. Points yeah. percentage. We'll get the but... college football committee in here to figure out who's in the playoffs. Oh, oh god yeah Pretty but much. that might be better than the way anyway whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> take, take, give, us, give us your uh your jersey take go go back to eggplant and jade go back to the eggplant and jade their current home and home jersey is a third jersey at best huh? eggplant and jade is just more iconic it's a better look everything's better about it okay well i mean i think that's three for three um my agnostic vote julie's hardline vote and jake's hardline vote so there you go <laughs> Okay, well... Everything old is now new again. Exactly. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't love the idea of just defaulting to something just because it's, you know, there's the nostalgia, but that look is just better. It's it cool. Ju it just is. Okay. Well, guys, this... Julie, this was a blast. I can't thank you enough for, for coming on here and divulging all of these state secrets to us you know we're really yeah if only you knew the real stories and secrets but i think yeah. that's great that's how you know that it was uh, an amazing job is that it there was there's a lot of things going to the grave with that job <laughs> that yeah. sounds so that sounds well they really, can't fire really you sketchy, anymore so you but, can spill uh, it all yeah. if you wanted to yeah, they can't fire me. And, and to be honest, in the first place, it wasn't even my job. So uh, I guess I wasn't even really hired. I just sort of like <laughs> fell into the job. And then I was just there. And I just kept showing up. And yeah. they're like, okay, well, I guess you can keep doing this. But uh, they are, they're great. I love the organization. I mean, there's different as aspects of it that are better than others or, you know, firing on different yeah. cylinders. And unfortunately, right now, I know you guys are in a bit of a tough spot. Um, hopefully... Whenever this podcast comes out, no one on the team has gotten anything from those Vegas Golden Knights. Yeah. But other than oh. that, uh, <laughs> you know, glad to see. Uh, glad, I'm sure you're glad to see hockey back. At least it's been a long time for Ducks fans. Yes. Oh yeah, it, it's it's been a very long time. Well, you know, the Ducks basically they did with you what they're you know trying to put off with Trevor Zegras because you hit the seven game mark, right? You burned your first year of the ELC, so. Mm -hmm. Might as well keep him around. You know, that's that's what we're... Zegras is great. I mean, yeah. God, so... that guy he, ruined he's... my World Juniors, <laughs> but yeah, it's good I mean, for Ducks fans. It was great. It was the great. Team and Canada's Americans. head coach ruined their, the World Juniors, but um, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Um, but yeah, with Zegras, anyway, I could go on about this forever. Okay, let's, let's just get out of here. Everybody check out Julie's show, Drinks with Binks. It's on Fubo Sports Network. It's on Fridays. 8 p.m. Eastern time. Actually, uh, we changed um, oh. the day oh, to okay. Wednesdays. I oh, will give Wednesday. that tip to my company that we are actually on Wednesdays now. <laughs> I am just reading what I was provided. So, uh, and, uh, Yes, that's okay. Let they, the record show. No one knows. No one knows my show at my company. But, <laughs> okay, uh, Wednesdays. We'll chugging along on, yeah, Wednesdays at 8 and 8.30. It's like two episodes of 
you know, we had we had John Cooper on after he won the Stanley Cup. We drank some Crown Royal with him and got all the secrets of the party. And then we have people on like uh, Eddie Olchek who who do not drink. And we also got, you know, great stories about working with Doc. And so it really is just like an interview over a beverage. And I go through my contact book and see who on my phone will come on my show every week. So That's it's a lot of fun. And uh, do it right from here where I do everything from because it's a pandemic and I don't leave this apartment <laughs> real, in real, Manhattan. Real quick, New do you have a question for you? Because the show is called Drinks with Binks, what is your go-to drink? Well, I always drink whatever my guest decides. Mm-hmm. So that can be many different things with Luke Wilson from the Sea Seahawks. Uh, well, he's a free agent right now. But he wanted coffee and that's it was 6 p.m. here. So I drank a 6 p.m. coffee. OK, it was wow. not ideal, that's but dedication. I did that. But then sometimes I had Grant Wall on um, a soccer writer. He mm-hmm. wanted a Mezcal Negroni at 9 a.m. So I drank a Mezcal Negroni at 9 a.m. So I just do whatever they want. And I love it when people bring in such interesting drinks sometimes. Yeah. Then I also can expense it. So Ooh. when people say like, oh, I really we got this like really awesome tequila once and my company bought it. I was like, yo, we don't have to get the like that brand. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, we don't need a $500 bottle of tequila. We can use the old like Jose Cuervo that I have in my, <laughs> you know, bar cart over here. But yes, it's, uh, I'd say I like whiskey sours and then rose. I'm basic over here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So if there was a drink, Julie Stewart Banks, what would it be like on a menu? Oh, um, it would be like it. It would probably be some sort of um, uh, sweet candy infused, like some whiskey, sweet egg white with like yes, like can- cotton candy or candy Ooh, on it. So it would be like it would be like one of those when you go to a bar and it, they take ten thousand hours to make your drink, and then it's like two sips. But it would be you. You'd put it on Instagram. You'd be like, oh my god, I have to get the Julie Stewart pinks. That's yeah. what matters. That's definitely what, what matters. What does egg white even do? It makes it smooth. Okay. So, um, yes, like that's why I like them with whiskey, whiskey sours, sours or like any kind of you can do it for many drinks. Put an egg white in there and then you are eating, you know, an egg when it's not cooked. So you could get sick. That's my disclaimer. But it makes it all taste really smooth and not be like too tart. You know, we all choose our risks, and some people choose <laughs> egg whites. Egg whites. <laughs> well, you, you brought up your Instagram, and I do recommend people follow you there at Julie S B underscore. Your stories are hilarious. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I uh, I highly recommend that. So go check out the show. That's at FuboSportsNetwork.com. We've actually used Fubo a bit, Jake and I, uh, to watch the World Juniors, and can vouch that their interface is good. Okay. Um, thank you. As- as far as our show, uh, just everybody knows, but I'll just quickly go over here. If you want to check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash crash the pond. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. And on Sunday nights, we go live 8 p.m. Pacific time on Twitch. So that will do it for us tonight, guys, on this episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Julie, again. And we'll talk at the next episode. Talk to you soon.